This week on Insanity, we are absolutely blessed to be able to be joined by none other than my very own guide. Ben was the person that was there for me when I needed someone most, when I had no idea how I was ever going to pull through. And I hope that if you are experiencing anything even close to that at this moment in your life, I hope this conversation gives you some kind of insight on what the next step could be for you moving forward. So please give a warm welcome to none other than Mr. Benjamin Parks, also known as Yoga Ben. Firstly, thank you very much for your time and for having this conversation. It's an important conversation. And I, yeah, I genuinely meant that. There was no one I wanted to have this conversation with more than you. You were there for my day one. When I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm broken. I don't know how I'm going to make it back this time. And you're like, we're going to be fine. Just one day at a time. Where do we start? when everything is heavy, when everything is a lot, when we've been through a lot and we feel raveled up and just tied up in, we don't even know what, and it's too much, it's too heavy. Where do we start? Mm. Yeah, good question. You pretty much nailed it just a moment ago, whether you're aware of it or not, when you said something like, I'm broken or we're broken, right? And mm. The first step is just to acknowledge the human frailty and the, the fact that you're imperfect and a broken human being like everybody else and that the the pain or the misery or the discomfort or the overwhelming fears or the waking up at three o'clock in the morning whatever it may be is there for a reason it's there for a purpose to call your attention right to say something's not right you've got to pay attention and that feels really hard because it's often really overwhelming and it weighs so heavy you don't know where to start sometimes you just have to survive those few days of upset misery uh, disorientation whatever it may be and then hold on to the idea or the fact that there's some work to do that something's been presented to you and you may not know what it is but the first step is just acknowledging it right that okay now it's here and what we often do with that moment mm -hmm. me included you know i've been doing it for a long time but it's like a, a layers, you know, it's just a cycle that goes round and round. It's the same thing each time. Sometimes I'm a bit more skillful, sometimes not. But the first step is just to acknowledge there's something not right, something wrong. Hold on to that possibility that you could grow or learn something or let something die, some part of you die. And then the horrible scary thing is that the where you start is at the edge of the cliff or hung over the this deep mm. chasm right and nobody wants to be there at all ever including me and so we've got plenty of ways of pulling back or numbing or masking or distracting ourselves from holy shit, I just do not want to deal with this. It's staring me right in the face and I'm, I just don't want to be here. From food to work to drugs to sex, you just the list is endless. All of the things that we might recognize as addictions or dependencies or just plain distractions, TV and stuff, you know. And it's okay to for us as human beings to distract ourselves and numb ourselves for a while because it is a painful experience being a human being. Not only that, but it is painful and we need a little bit of uh, leeway sometimes, you know, you just need to give yourself a break and uh, if it's low end uh, comfort like poor foods or crappy TV, fine, right? But it's when we're getting stuck in that loop of constantly numbing or constantly distracting and never attending to what's being asked of you over this chasm mm -hmm. or at the edge of this cliff you never attend to it you're just diving down further and further into misery and not actually 
finding this root wisdom, your own wisdom from your own experience. So where you start is acknowledgement. Okay, something is wrong and needs my attention. Notice I don't say needs fixing. There's a lot of focus on let's fix this, right? I need something to make it better. But counterintuitively in our culture, what actually needs to happen is go deeper into this into the pain. Go deeper into the sadness. Be willing to be broken further. You know? And nobody wants mm. to do that. When you're in a place where you're already feeling broken and I know from the first day that we did my first ever session with you I remember thinking I'm that broken I don't even think I can make it back this is the first time in my life I don't think I'm ever going to make it back from this one so to be able to sit in a place to them acknowledge okay I need to actually go deeper into this that's that's a scary place to find yourself how do we make that more manageable yeah the the thing we're facing there in that moment, if you're standing at the edge of the cliff or you're looking down into the chasm, the dark chasm below you, the thing that we're facing is death. And it might be, it's often just a metaphorical death in that there isn't really any real threat to your life. Although at the edges of this turmoil, there might be something horrible like suicide or, you know, that's the worst it could get, right? But there's this death of who we are everything we know so far, all our habits, routines, and ways that we live, people that we interact with. And the concept hits us like all this could just dissolve and go away and die. And it rightly creates this huge deep breath overwhelm because something in there in you is saying, don't do this because it's all right. We're doing okay, I think. Let's just carry on. Why Why rock the boat, man? Let's just carry on. It's not that bad, is it? And then the mm. often, often the answer is when you contemplate carrying on as normal. Initially, there's a relief. Like, yeah, I don't have to do this now. But then there's just this cold, hard stare of that's yeah. going to be my life then. Fuck. And then you're caught, aren't you, between... I don't want to make any changes because it's terrifying and I might die metaphorically or literally. Mm. And I don't want to carry on as I am because it's just empty or miserable or unfulfilling. And there you are stuck right in the middle. That, that's the place to start and acknowledge it. I am, it's almost like being crucified in this moment of extreme presence. People talk about being present in the moment, right? And it's often a really nice meditative soft glow candle presence but can you be present when all of that is going on that's the mm. challenge yeah and the thing is we're not taught either it's not even that we're not taught we don't see it anywhere in our culture death and rebirth it's not something that we are introduced to in the sense of dying without physically dying and passing away dying in the sense of allowing parts of ourselves to die away even from that transition the really important one from teenage to adult life I think a lot of the struggles that we have is simply because we haven't allowed that younger self to die away the stuff that happened from that time to die away and we carry it into our adulthood we haven't transitioned into being an adult yet so we're still being and acting and feeling from our younger versions of ourselves and I think you're right 100% if we just understood that dying is inevitable and but on the back of death is rebirth you then have a new sense of life one that is fulfilling mm. you're plugging into a lot of ways that our culture lets us down or doesn't meet us in our growth into adulthood there there's a few angles like the child we there's a lot of adults walking around who are basically just children in adults bodies and i was one of those Sometimes I still am, but I am was one of those up to the, at least the age of 30. I'm 44 now. As you say, there's no way for our culture to bring you on, bring you out of childhood and into adulthood. 
there's lots of interviews and looked at a way indigenous tribes and communities do it they've all got ways of initiating their young and it often involves something violent or difficult or traumatic and it's death it's the death of the mm. child that's the traumatic part metaphorically of course because you're mm. not actually killing them and if you're not willing to if you're not met like that in your culture then you just you pop up in your middle 20s or 30s and you sort of what just happened <laughs> and feeling yeah. lost and abandoned and it might not be the case that anybody's actually abandoned you you might know where you are but in your soul in your sense of self and in your wider connection to the people around you it's just you feel lost and broken right mm. so we don't get met and guided through and the other thing you were plugging into there was this sort of Stephen Jenkinson talks about this a lot the, the death phobic society that we live in the death is removed at all moments from mm. our lives from funerals down you know that the dead body is taken away and death is taken away our nhs which is a beautiful gift for us has at its root don't worry we will fix you you don't ever have to think about death or disease or anything like that and of course people are suffering and uh, facing that every day in in the nhs but there's this persuasion from our culture that don't you don't need to you don't need to worry about that we'll take care of that just keep going keep distracting keep moving forward keep fixing and that just doesn't work it's not sustainable so people crash and burn and they are broken and they feel alone and they don't know what to do they don't know where to start and little do they know that this crisis or this trauma or this difficulty that's come their way is is this place to start it's coming for you it's mm. death metaphorically coming for you to do the work that hasn't yet been done catch up time it feels almost like when you say it like that i visually i just saw like the grim reaper coming and but we've been taught to fear the grim reaper like even the visual aspect of that is like don't that's scary that's bad oh no now i'm gonna die but actually there's the most beautiful thing waiting for you in the darkness, in the death, in the stuff that we hide, the shadow, the scary side. I was petrified to touch that before, petrified to look at that. Too big, too much. How could I ever be able to handle what's in that darkness if I take the lid off, let alone who's holding space for me, if anyone? Yeah, there's another very important bit, right, is who's, who's with you? Because we're often on our own and isolated and... Mm abandoned and lonely in these moments and there seems to be no one available and, and there aren't many good mentors or good teachers or good elders who will come in those moments they are around yeah but thin and few and far between but thin on the ground right and you do need somebody preferably like a whole village or a whole room full of people to gather you up in those moments not to make it better but just to stand in a circle around you while you plunge off the edge of that cliff right and be willing to reach their arms in and drag you out when it gets hairy but they're not going to fix it for you but they're going to stand with you right in love and that's often missing yeah and i know when you have someone there with you you feel safer to go into that space to go into the areas that just are that just seem impossible to even begin to look at. Having that safety from another presence of someone who is there, like you said, with unconditional love and support for you, that will be there to pull you out when it gets too dark or too much, or be there to say, you're on, I know this is scary, I know this is hard, but keep going, you're almost there. You're almost at the crux of it. Keep going. You were vital for me doing that. There is no way I'd have been able to do that by myself. So where do people go? Where would we even find that kind of community or that type of support from someone yeah such a, a yearning isn't it in us if, we, if anyone who's ever been there and in, in that dark night of the soul and 
you snap out of it for a moment and look around for the support or the the elders or the loved ones who will come to you and often our family and friends are the worst people in those moments to go to they just don't know what to do and they're too heavily involved in your life mm. to help they just want you fixed and back up and running and they can't bring the necessary presence and attention it's not their fault it's just the, the setup mm. and then because it's thin on the ground often you're just left you don't die you sort of the next day comes nothing's changed and you sort of get back on the treadmill and on you go until the next time it comes in to demand your attention again um and that happens again and again until it gets really shit and really painful and this phrase which i think was stephen jenkins and again pain pushes until wisdom pulls right so pain will keep pushing mm. and pushing and hitting you and demanding your attention and fucking up your life until you listen and a wis wisdom has a chance to grow pain pushes until wisdom pulls and that can be your whole life in tatters so where do you 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 ask where do you go so if you just take my journey for example it's not the only way and there's many ways of doing it and that it's not linear either it can go around in layers but i hit the bottom and went into alcoholics anonymous that was like the safety net at the bottom of that chasm which i was falling down but not consciously falling down and alcoholics anonymous scooped me up and held me there it doesn't doesn't really elevate you it just catches you and that was the first place where I actually heard some honesty from people talking about their lives and their difficulties. And it's useful, I think, those 12-step programs because people are honest and vulnerable with each other. And then we get a sense of connection. And I, I'm not, it's not just me experiencing this. It's always very various levels of suffering in an Alcoholics Anonymous um, room like I remember one time on one side of me was this lawyer who was really suffering and his life was just falling apart and on this side of me was a drunk who just smelled like piss and vomit and he was in an absolute mess and I just thought well yeah that's that's the that's the spectrum we were all just flowing along that and I, here I am in the middle somewhere um and the that's a starting point is these sort of rescue organizations or these safety net groups that hopefully will catch you on the way down. But if you're able to be a little bit more proactive and not wait until it all falls apart tremendously, then the next stage for me was uh, a men's group organization called Mankind Project, which is a charity that... Mm -hmm. And we were talking about um, initiations earlier of the of the the child that doesn't happen in our culture. So essentially, what Mankind Project is an initiation ceremony for men. It's made up from different cultures and aspects and influences. It's not really authentically rooted in any culture, but it's the best we've got for our, a culture like ours where it doesn't exist right so it was it's like a a fill-in ceremony or initiation for boys boy men to become men men uh, in some small way and that what that did was take me off the safety net of aa and up one rung as it were to to be able to have some agency in my own life and what was key in that was and this is perhaps true, for, it is true for a lot of men I know, but I'm not sure about women. You'll have to let me know. This is all generalizing, but in that experience with other men, it was crucially a place where we could share the things that we believed would get us thrown out of society if we dared to allow them up in the real world things like 
our sexuality, our anger, um, our uh, strength, our physical prowess, our ability to um, destroy. And so all of these things which are buried in shame for a lot of men. And they think, if I let this up, it'll either destroy me or my loved ones or, you know, there is no place for men's anger in our world apart from on the football terraces or in sport is often the sort of outlet you see men screaming on those terraces and weeping right so grief is another one and in that mankind project weekend i was able to allow those feelings up and those aren't mass male feelings they're just human feelings anger grief sadness fear and see that we're all experiencing them they're they're just real they may not have they may not have space for them in in the real world but they're actually real and taking place all the fucking time and we're sitting on them very hard trying not to let them out and letting them out allows energy to flow so that you can take what might be seen as a negative emotion like um anger or rage and turn it into pure power or pure energy that you can then work wonders with in the world and that's just such a beautiful thing for a man to do and for a human being to do and um i think women go through similar but different experiences um but i can only speak from that perspective and then so if, uh, from the bottom rung of the safety net of Alcoholics Anonymous up to Mankind Project, where I was able just to stand in my true self. And what I noticed was all the yoga practice and philosophy that I'd been working on for about eight to ten years by that point. What it was saying at its core was yoga is here because human beings are broken we're scattered and yoga is a way of putting us back together and making us more whole the word yoga means union or yoke to make whole and then to answer the question right at the beginning where do you go you go to somewhere that enables you to become more wholly fully you to have all those parts of you that are sitting in shadow or that you don't trust or that you pretend aren't there to rise up to create a mm -hmm. fucking mess, if necessary, in a held container, not in the real world, but in a held space, and then to be integrated into who you are, because you are that person, not exclusively, you know, it doesn't entirely define you, that um, that angry man, speaking for myself, or that um, withdrawing, silent, black cloud man, it doesn't exclusively make me up, but it is a part of me which is actually useful in some way when transformed. So you, where you need to go is somewhere that will enable more of you to be present and more of you to be alive and more of you to be seen. And there are a lot of workshops out there, a lot of groups out there, a lot of coaches and teachers. Find a good one. And if, if it's open, open, more of me, more of me, keep going, you know? Keep harvesting more of yourself back. Become whole. Become who you are. Mm. I like what you said because this is important. It the space allows you to be as messy as you need to be in that safe container, so that you're not doing that in the real world. And I guess that is why it is so important to have a safe space where you can go and do that, where you can show up completely messy, let all of the, those scattered pieces completely fly around so that you can figure out how to then rejig that puzzle again in a safe space where you've got people holding space for you because if you try and do that in the real world like you said our family and our friends they don't know how to address those kind of things our work wouldn't know how to address that society as a whole would see that as oh no there's something wrong there you know we need to either give them some space a wide berth or we need to chuck a load of medication on them or whatever it might be something Whereas if you just take that exact same thing and put it in a safe space where someone's holding you, you realise actually that, yes, there's something wrong, but there's nothing wrong, if that makes sense. You just need to rejig, restructure, re-welcome the parts that, as you said, that have just been 
scattered or hidden away for so long or suppressed and sat on. Mm. Yeah, we there's not really much space for us to fall apart, you know. It happens at the most inconvenient of times because mm. we've held on and held on and holding on tighter and tighter and finally we can't do it anymore and we just break in the middle of um, a work meeting or on the tube or uh, while you're at, Chris- at Christmas at family house, right? That's a good time for it. That's that's <laughs> yeah. just messy. That's just ter- a terrible way to do mm. it. But it that's the only way that's offered through our, through our sort of conventional culture. And you have to sort of move to the edges a bit and search in the in the undergrowth or as it were or in the forests or out in the in the wilds to find places where you can with other people express fully who you are without being shut down again and um one of the things i think over the years i've noticed is the good ones have been there themselves so they stand by you and walk with you into that terrifying soul space that you where you don't want to go. They'll walk with you because they've been to the equivalent or something similar themselves and returned. You know, and you can sense that about someone. If they're pretending and sending you off into the darkness on your own, you'll feel that. But if they've mm. been there themselves and they are able to communicate that by their presence and their willingness. Yeah, okay, let's let's do this. Let's let's go together into this darkness. You're reassured because they've been into the valley of death and returned and haven't died. Maybe part of them died, right? But they didn't they didn't well they weren't annihilated by their own fears. And that's relationship, right? That's getting to know a group or somebody or trust that intuition that you have they're our elders they're our only mentors now and also like you said with them having experienced it themselves I guess to understand because if maybe you're in a place where you're not fully in touch with that intuition yet or you can second guess it you know we've been taught at some point to second guess that intuition and that gut feeling potentially one of the ways to know if someone is the right person to take you into that or if you know, because like everything, there's a duality. There's amazing men's groups. There's very poor ones. There's amazing women's group. There's very poor ones. And I know we've had that conversation quite a lot before. One way to maybe know if that is the right person for you or the right group would be, are they actually challenging my belief? Are they challenging me? Are they, when I'm riding a high or I'm really wanting to, you know, I'm feeling really good all of a sudden, this is amazing. And I'm flying through the sky on this euphoric feeling are they actually allowing me to come back down and if I'm staying up there too long are they bringing me back down and giving me the harsh truth sometimes that maybe I don't want to hear or you know something in that aspect I think sometimes if we ignore our intuition we're not in touch with it then it's hard to understand who someone is but there's little key points that you can point out are they challenging me is my one that's really good because you're so right there's a lot of cowboys out there it's just a human nature to Get, we disappear up our own assholes, you know. We think our ego takes over, and we think we're wonderful, and <laughs> we then want to Jesus that out to the world, and it doesn't translate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. And I, you know, I can feel that part of me. That's why I know it. It's because there's a part of me like that. Like I'm right, you're wrong. I know the way. Just listen to me and. The other thing that I would look for in people, and it, it's not always available instantly, which is why this is such a tricky path, because you can fall down holes that cause even more pain. And that, that's just mm. a shit thing. And you'll get through I it. think it's inevitable as it's well inevitable. at some point. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, it is inevitable. But keep going. And the, if you can spot someone who seems to have something that you would like you know there's something about them you think yeah i want a piece of that but they are also challenging themselves and crucially they are also falling apart in front of your eyes not while they're holding space for you Uh, you want them to be steady at that point but 
in some other relationship context in a group or that you see them go back into the valley of that valley of death because it's not just one time in and then back out and you're all done this comes back Mm -hmm. over and over (laughs) again right Uh, to this to the point where you're like oh this again really (laughs) again (laughs) yes i thought i dealt with this i thought i'd done this and it's just not integrated yet it needs a bit more work it needs to be done again it's tricky that is it but keep going if you get burnt by someone you know that's just being in relationship we always get hurt eventually that doesn't mean there isn't love there but keep going and move move right move to different groups try out different teachers and practices and um weekend experiences just you don't get stuck and it's it's a tricky one tricky path that but it's worth it rather than the alternative which is more of the same and for the people that maybe think i'm not ready for a men's group or a woman's group or something that's along the avenue of with big groups of people and maybe don't have someone that's an individual that they can go to in your opinion or things that you've used yourself would you say are are tools that you can use by yourself with yourself to start that process that maybe then gets you into a place where you think okay I'm starting to navigate through myself a little bit more this is still very this is still a lot but I'm I'm understanding now that there is a path and I've I've actively taken the first couple of steps what would in your opinion be some of the tools that we can use at home Mm. that's a really good thing to have in your sort of tool belt things that you can pull on for that very purpose i would say right at the beginning as before we go into them that it's always very best when you're with somebody good who's helping you there's there's something in that coming together of two souls that makes it more impactful but the work that you do on on your own is crucial as well so I'll start with me and then expand out. So writing for me is a way to put all of that or all of that out onto a page and get a slight distance from it and see it in front of me as as something that is interesting and what the fuck am I going to do with that then? But yeah, writing or journaling create this, this separation between the the self or the ego or whatever we might want to call it this this made up version that navigates in the world which is crucial we need it but behind that there's there's this universal huge all being right and what we need to do is just step out of that narrow ego self bit which is the one going your life is fucked you can't do anything about it don't go over the cliff, don't go and see anybody. It's always trying to help out, right? But it just won't let go. And we need to be able to step out of that into transcendence or the universe or light or love, whatever you want to call it, right? And something else then takes over. And so techniques, there are so many techniques because humanity has been at this for thousands of years. Yoga is a big one. Yoga somehow allows you to integrate and also step back from yourself and find the breath you know become more present and meditation uh, these won't be unfamiliar to people some people like to use art i know somebody who just puts all this out onto the page i can't do that i can do it with words but not 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 paint but we've perhaps skipped over the very best beautiful way that which I'm looking at out of the window right now and by the coast in Suffolk in my van, is nature. Mm-hmm. Nature is, mm. and I'm talking like coast or forest or valley or mountain, not the park. There, there, are, it is, there are pockets available in the park. But once we get out into nature and... You pass the first 15 minutes, past the first hour, your brain's just easing off slightly, hopefully. Something will happen in nature, whether it's the waves suddenly draw your attention or a bird calls or you see a flower, or you smell something or you hear something. Something will happen and it just makes you stop. And in that precious little moment, the self stuff 
uh, is bypassed and you're suddenly present with all that is. And they're so, such beautiful moments and often very fleeting. They're gone instantly. As soon as they arrive, they're gone. But that is, for me, the the hope. It's the, there is something beyond my turmoil. There's something else, something other that is, I'm deeply part of and deeply connected to. And I just got it from a cloud that, went across the sun like that and made me wow just that little moment and that's not very much comfort if you're if you're depressed and drinking and taking drugs and eating and stuck in your room it's not very much comfort you say oh well great lucky for you glad you had a nice walk but it works it works (laughs) nature works yeah it does i find as well when you're in a big open space you can see Mm. perspective you because you can physically see a bigger perspective even if you're in a wood area and you're looking up and there's huge trees everything like you said is such it's so much more vast it's bigger it's wider and for some reason it helps my brain then open up I feel like I then have a bigger perspective in my mind Mm. but I can also go because there's so much air around me there's so much space I can take in a breath I feel like there's now space within me to go okay let me just take a breath for a second Mm. and just get a bit of perspective on Mm. what the hell is going on Mm. i can't do that when i'm in four walls yeah in a box the boxes we live in boxes don't we and um they're very hard to escape culture encourages us to you work in a box then you go home to your box and don't get out of the box because if you get out of your box you might actually become a dynamic, radical, beautiful version of who you actually are (laughs) and start spreading love into the world. (laughs) Who you were always meant to be from the beginning. But, you know, like I said earlier, if you can't get to nature or you can't do yoga or you can't meditate because it's all too much, then down at the other end, those low-skill, numbing, aspects which get a lot of bad press they're okay for a little while the phone instagram tv whatever gets you through to the next day or the next moment but then know that that stuff is just biding time it's not going to help and that it will get you to the next part and the next moment and then you need to reassess and are you ready now no okay have another chocolate Mm -hmm. see you in an hour (laughs) ready now no looking at instagram and it'll just because it'll keep coming keep coming back and why that is i've been thinking about this for decades just like why what is this about being human on the earth and having to go through all this pain why not just endless joy and happiness and and if if you start at the point that you're connected to everything and part of this world and i'm talking people animals the earth the oceans the sky that you're connected to everything then you your role is to be part of that and to to immerse in that but our culture says Mm. separate from that charles eisenstein talks about this a lot this this culture of separation that we're in and when we're separated from nature or each other men in particular can just fuck things up to a terrifying level it's not always men but we are really good at separating and then destroying or hurting but we're also really good at building and loving and connecting you know so yeah if you start at the point of connection You've got a, you've got a job here, right? You, you're part of it. You're part of the story. So, dive off the cliff. You know, dive into the hole. Find out what's down there, because that's your job here on this lifetime. It's not to go to work every day and make money and yeah. That's that's just distraction. Although we can't avoid it, but that's not your job. Your job here is to get conscious and find out what you're here for. 
which is a bit challenging for people because like yeah but i just want to watch strictly come dancing <laughs> and each i've got so used to this routine i don't want to break away from it yeah yeah and that but that's a really good point actually we get so stuck in a routine or a, a cycle of living and a way of being that actually even though we know we're not happy and even though we know we want to be better or be different or whatever it might be. I just want to live a more fulfilling life. We know we're not satisfied or we don't like how people are treating us, but we don't want to change that by speaking up for ourselves. Why do we do that to ourselves when we know we want change and we know that we could be happier or stronger within ourselves or whatever it might be that's on the other side, but we choose to sit in pain over the discomfort of not knowing what's on the other side. Why do we do that to ourselves? Yeah, why do we do that? I think there's a couple of things there. First is we are survivors. Our species is like we can we can survive anything and so far we've cruised to the top. The the earth might argue not not so great, but anyway, here we are. And um we we will just batten down and drive through as human beings we've got this massive survival instinct and we'll we'll take any amount of hardship and pain if we have to and then the other on the other side is we're absolutely terrified of pain and we'll do anything to avoid it and that for me is very natural because who wants to be in pain whether it's physical or emotional i don't want to be in pain ever but it, if you spend your life attempting to avoid it or denying that it's ever going to come your way, then you are about to be rudely awakened if you haven't been already because it will come for you. And if you manage somehow to avoid it for the whole of your life, you are in for a big surprise when you die because it's all going to come crashing in as we learn from the deathbeds of people who testify to what happens a question that I did actually have from someone for you was they know they need to change certain things. That being, they know they need to start standing up for themselves and they need to start correcting people when they are mistreating them or when they're speaking down to them. And they're scared or the, actually their words were, I'm worried about if I change what people will then think of me. And I'm worried about, what happens when I change why would we be so worried about that form of change when we know that we're doing something that's aligning with who we really are we don't want to be treated poorly so we're going to stand up for ourselves but why do we fear then other people not liking our new version of ourselves in your opinion yeah just from from my own heart in response to that not that it's uh, the full answer, but things to explore is, first of all, there's the full circle there is this person doesn't like the way they're being treated, right? So they don't speak up. But then they think, well, if I speak up, then people won't like who I am. So they're just stuck between a rock and a hard place. This way they're being treated is bad. It's a shit situation and they can't speak up. Over here is... I'm not going to speak up in case they don't like me, but I don't like it, but they don't like me. And it's just this endless loop, which is what we get stuck in. And the loop is just the sort of entry point. And what we need to do, so here's the cliff, right? Here's the, the chasm. So this person is standing on the edge of that cliff. And what's happening is she's stuck. Uh, sorry, this person is stuck. I don't know whether it's a man or a woman. This person is stuck and won't speak up, but is afraid of speaking up. What's underneath that? You know, why, why would they do that? And if I was to take a guess, just um, from experience of working with people, we dive down into the chasm with this person. What we will find is this sort of loop happened to them, firstly, as a kid with their parents or someone close to them. The same sort of um, messages were were downloaded into this person. If you speak up, you won't receive love, right? And you will be abandoned or left alone. And then once we get to 
the bottom of that where the message originated, the origins of this behavior, because uh, the behavior is just a behavior, but it it, it started somewhere uh, in often in in our youth, in our young days, but sometimes in our adulthood. Get to the root of it. So you're not speaking up in your relationship because back then, if you were to speak up as a child, you would have been denied love, right? And what what would then happen? So then we're into why do people fear this so much? Why doesn't this person just speak up? Because every time they're challenged to speak up, this regression happens and they go right back to that point of childhood or that initial pain. And it says, don't speak up because there will be no more love. And then what happens is, because I have no control and I'm young and vulnerable, then I'm alone and there's no one to look after me. And then I wither and die at the side of the road on my own. It just becomes this terrible, tragic, deathly journey, which has no real base in reality, but is an emotional response. It's, it's an emotional fear. And why, so you think, well, why is our, our mind or our heart hitting us with that sort of shit? Because as children and as vulnerable people, we need to be looked after. We need love. And the very worst thing that could happen to you as a member of a tribe back in the day is that you were outcast. Because if you were outcast and you didn't have the support of your tribe, you're fucked. You're going to be dead within weeks because you haven't got the ability to look after yourself. And so we get in, it's this deep, ancient, rooted place of up here on the day to day, I can't speak up for myself in case people don't like me. But dig right down is I'm not going to speak up for myself because I will be alone and then I face death. And this is a strange link between the two that makes no sense, but it's definitely there. So then you zoom back up to the top, right? This is fast forward. This might take months or years. You zoom back up to the top and you say, is this true? You know, could you speak up um, for people might not like it? And what would be the worst that would happen, right? And so you find out that, okay, maybe some people don't like you, but actually you get a bit of what you want. You get a bit tougher. You get a bit stronger. You're able to speak up for yourself. You lose some relationships. You have some arguments. It's a bit messy, but it's not terminal. You're not going to be wiped off the face of the planet of the Earth, of the planet Earth. And so we we have to look, take the behaviour. That's the invitation to dive off the cliff, dive in, and find out yeah. what's going on down there, which is feeding back up subconsciously. Because whenever we're in our day to day, there's always these subconscious things firing up back here, back here, down here, affecting our behaviour, and we think. What just happened? Why did I react that way in that? Or why did I feel that fear? Or why did I shout like that? What happened? And we think, I must be a bad person or I failed somehow. And then we pack it back down into the bottom of the cliff again. And we really just got to get down there and find out what's going on. So that's a sort of very fast run through of a whole potentially a lifetime's process, you know? Um, also, I just say the reason I slipped into saying she was because often I find women have been programmed as young girls not to be angry, not to be naughty, not to be speak up, not to challenge, to be nice little girls, to be so that, so that a man will love you, right? Otherwise, whoa. And actually, that's bullshit because you've been denied <laughs> yes. your power and you can't speak up. Mm. Um, so that has to die when we get down to the bottom of the cliff and we find the programming be a nice little girl and then daddy will love you you know or some some version of that right whoa so then the little girl if i don't be a nice little girl i won't get love then i'm gonna die and it's all gonna be horrible mm -hmm. then we just need to destroy that kill that off or flip it flip it into its opposite which is of course I should speak up and I'll get the love that I deserve, right? So just completely take that and yeah. turn it around and do 
do the opposite. So it's the same energy, but you're just making it for you rather than against you. Um, and then see how your relationships go. There'll be a lot of shocked uh, boyfriends, fathers and mothers around, but you're going to shape <laughs> up a life which <laughs> yes. you quite enjoy instead of a life which is making you miserable and run by your subconscious. And you would be right, it was a she. <laughs> so you on point there. When you said about when you get to that bottom bit and it's the identity that we've formed for ourselves, it is so challenging to let that identity fall away. Mm. Really hard. That's something I've been working through whilst being here in this window of time, letting fully the good girl, the polite girl, the quiet girl, that you need to act this way, otherwise you don't get loved or you don't get attention or whatever it might be. You're not welcome here if you don't act a certain way that's prim and proper. Allowing that side to die away because not only is it petrifying to have your identity that you formed for your whole life gone, but then it's like, well, what comes in place? Who's now going to step forward? Who is this person? And then, like you said, the other side of that, and I know we've explored this and through the work I did with you, we figured out that this good girl side, this loving, giving side was white. And then the back side, when you invited me to look at, well, what's on the other side? Because there must be the back side of this. The back side came through as red. And this red version of me does want to say her truth, does want to speak up for herself and will not let you mistreat her at any expense. And now allowing red to come forward and be the person and the the way of living and being that is now in the driver's seat, but without fully disregarding. I mean, I let white die away as needed, but I kept the essence and the beauty of what white was and what white brought to the table and fused it. And I cannot thank you enough for doing that session because I think it started because like you said, there was an invitation. I kept feeling like I was carrying guilt and I came to you and was like, Ben, I feel so guilty all the time. Why am I carrying so much guilt? I don't even know what I'm guilty for. And it was that simple question that you said to me. So what do you feel guilty for? And I was like, I don't know. And you're like, you, you will know. We'll just give it space. We'll just have a look, delve in and have, have a look. And then there, all these things started coming out. And then, like you said, we dove right into that place. And underneath the guilt was never anything to do with the word guilty. It looked totally different. The, like, the form of it was totally different. And that's something that really I find liberating. And I think that's actually why I come back time and time again. And I'm more resilient in doing the scary work with you because I know that I'm going to be surprised. As much as it's scary and it's hard and it's challenging as hell when you're doing it, I, I'm always intrigued that intrigue wins by making me come back to see, well, if the word is guilty or the feeling I'm having right now is guilt, I wonder what is actually underneath all of that because I know it's not actually guilt and it's probably not even mine. I'm probably carrying someone else's bag right now and I need to put it down. That for me was liberating, letting that fall away and letting this other side that I've always feared coming forward, feared that fierceness, that strength, that power within red to come forward and be the person or the present energy is scary to begin with petrifying but also once you do it liberating is the best feeling ever yeah i want to meet red she sounds cool <laughs> she's a cool woman i really like her i'm loving yeah. getting snow red yeah and beautifully described in your own journey then what you did was bring the um, nuance to it as well because we talk about letting parts die right and that's true but actually a part of us can, we can never let it die it's going to be there all the time it's a metaphorical death where we we detach from it let it let go of all the patterns let go of all the holding let go of all the stupid messages that it's taken on which are enforced upon it that it dies in that way and then what it sounded like you did you circled back round once you discovered red and set her free and become more of who you are. You circled back round, gathered up white, the essence of her, the beauty of white, integrated her in as well. Then you're more of who you are, more fully red and white because you're both of these things. But initially, you're absolutely right. It's terrifying to sit there when you discover part of yourself and think, am I this person? Mm. I can't believe it. This, the, the way that you described your exploration was there was a new part of you that was waiting in the background, red, and initially it was terrifying to come into contact with that, right? It was 
scary mm. you didn't know whether you could incorporate or be that person but you are very much that person that's just waiting to step in for your life and bring in new ways of living like new parts of you that have been quiet or in the shadow and then you were able to nuance it a bit because then you circled back round to pick up white who can't really die because we can't really kill off parts of ourselves but we need them to, to transcend or change we need them to um let go of their habits and their misapprehensions so you came back around you picked the essence of white and incorporated that and became more fully who you were which is that for me is it's got to be the work that we're doing becoming truly fully who we are and able to be that in the world and it's really hard it's terrifying when you discover that you are this person as well you know, this part of your personality in this aspect of who you are and you might not like it and you might have judgments about it but it's who you are and soon you start being that person whether or not people are criticizing you or objecting the better it will go and you start to step into your life more is that's the theory anyway yeah beautifully said and i think like you said it's scary to welcome them especially if we've got um ideas about what we think that version of ourself means or is or if we compare it to other people that maybe have similar traits i know that was my thing i was scared to be red because red represented someone who i was definitely not wanting to become or i was scared to even be in association with but actually now in me incorporating red i've completely changed my entire outlook on that human being and in me embodying red for somehow it's also completely healing my relationship to that person and our dynamic and it's inviting them to now become more white which has changed everything for me me taking on red has somehow brought out that white sweet work there's the relationship now it ripples out into the world if we circle right back around to the beginning if you're in pain or something terrible happening or you're overwhelmed do what you need to to get through but don't pop out the other end come back to the invitation the pain is the invitation to stand at the edge and when you're ready and hopefully when you've got support dive down into the into the darkness and find out what's happening that's where it all lies that's where the wisdom and the learning lies so if you're feeling like i don't know where to start it's probably continually coming to knock at your door you just got to listen and let it in one day uh, even if letting it in feels like you'll be annihilated or disappear off the face of the earth that probably won't happen but what will happen instead is that you rediscover parts of yourself that you can incorporate into your life and live more fully uh that's waiting for us all of us and so if we were to just in maybe on one hand recap the things that you'd suggested either maybe a men's group or a woman's group to help connect and find people there to support you you spoke of mankind because that's what you've been a part of and if we don't feel that that's the right avenue for us at the moment then other avenues I remember you said to find something that makes you feel more you that brings out more of you where there is a group of you together that you can do that in a safe environment in some way and if it's to be with an individual person actively seek out try and find someone seek people that have lived it already that's already walked that path that have the t-shirt that can help navigate you through if those are inaccessible for you at the moment and you need to be with yourself then journaling or writing some kind of just exploring welcome it in and take it out of yourself allow there to be some distance between you and and the part of you that keeps knocking on the door so maybe writing would be, or some form of ex exploring outwardly, drawing, painting, making, whatever it might be, or sitting with someone that you feel is a safe person that you could maybe just have an open conversation with and say, look, I'm feeling like this and I don't know why. Is it something I can talk to you about for a moment? Yeah, you've got them all there, right? Yeah. There's so many different directions you can head, but I guess they would come into groups or categories of, what to do and where to go so there's people and relationships and that might be groups or individuals or someone that you think has something to offer 
and you trust and seems to be walking the talk. Or there's um, nature, I mustn't forget that, because it's right there when we get out of the oh, yes. cities and the towns and into nature. Consciousness is there waiting for us, just waiting to nudge us out of our turmoil or take us over the edge slightly and really feel what's going on. Um, and then the meaningful work part, these are ideas from Darren Allen's work, but the meaningful work part is that journaling or the writing or art or some sort of craft that isn't done for money, and isn't done for um, someone else, is done purely for the point of it being done, than what that ha what happens in you when you do it, and what happens hopefully is that you are extracted from the torturous self or ego and able to connect to an experience even for just a moment uh, the universe or the greater being or consciousness itself and that's ultimately why we're here i think to explore that and then express it and so start there perfectly said and i think there's definitely going to be a part two for sure so we'll be able to discuss way more things See next time as well two, yeah I'm so grateful for your time of having the conversation. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thanks, Lou. Thank you.